freer markets and simply just leaving people alone is the closest thing to a miracle one can witness in this life. Its biggest disadvantage? It doesn't deliver overnight. That's why it's the closest thing to a miracle and not one per se. But within a span of a generation, freer markets can change a place that used to be under an unfree regime almost beyond recognition in terms of prosperity. And that's no small thing at all. But prosperity cannot change everything, and it especially cannot change human nature itself. If you know where and how to look, most of this is self-evident almost everywhere in post-communist Albania. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the third featured installment of the 2018 Albania tour. In the last episode we left the story in the period right after the first non-communist government is elected in 1992 and I promised then that we'd focus a bit more on the economy and on the people and less on the machinations of the government and hopefully I'll be able to live up to that promise. It's not very easy, considering that there is very little work available on the recent economic history of Albania, but I got a bit lucky thanks to an Albanian chap of Bulgarian descent, who, upon finding out what I was doing while he was helping me get the correct bus, told me he worked in the economics-related departments in the government in late 1990s, and he was able to at least tell me where to look. Again. I am under no illusion that I will be able to do justice to the topic in one hour, but with the knowledge gathered on the ground I do hope to at least paint a broad picture. So, for the purposes of this talk, the presentation is divided as follows. Number 1. Political history of the post-communist regimes. Number 2. Economic history and present-day situation. And number 3. Conclusions and what to expect in the near future, where I will be exercising my abilities to make predictions. So, let us begin. Political history after the fall of communism is the first period that can be described as arguably similar with other places. If you remember from the previous episodes, communism in Albania was significantly different, and by that I mean significantly worse, and the Ottoman period was also marked by distinct features that were simply not replicated anywhere else in southeastern Europe. However, the post-communist period is one that has a lot in common with the post-communist intermarium, but in the spirit of Albanian politics, with some excesses that ended up being rather unique to the country. The government had the task of trying to achieve something that virtually nobody alive in the country knew much about, namely to transition the place to a capitalist democracy and the rule of law, preferably in such a way that doesn't lead to a war or an economic catastrophe. Sadly, they sort of got them both. Now, the war part is not normal, but severe economic problems were quite normal since every post-communist country had troubles with high inflation due to several competing interests. On one hand, the economy's natural tendency to reassess itself based on the new parameters, and on the other hand, the state's inherent tendency to try to regulate it. 
but more on that later. The initial tasks of the government after the first basic freedoms had already been established during the interim and unclear period between 91 and 92, and that was to somehow start rebuilding. Now, on this channel I've shown you, and will show you a lot more in the future, many post-communist areas that speak of the destitution left by the tyrannical regimes of Marxist-Leninist inspiration. But in Albania the situation was even more critical than the Marxist-Leninist average. The infrastructure was crumbling to levels simply unimaginable in, say, Poland or Romania or Hungary in the same period, let alone other places. For instance, the power outages due to infrastructure failure were still a thing as late as 2009 and 2010, including in the capital city. That's because almost anything built during the communist era in Albania was not built with the free people in mind, and it didn't help at all that the communists killed everyone who had any idea about how to do that. While other countries in the Intermarium sought external loans late into the 1990s, the Albanian government tried to access such loans quite early on, but here comes the first particularity, failed because Greece opposed. Now, the constant strife with Greece is a huge can of worms that I won't get into right now, but it is worth mentioning that Greece vetoed an EU loan to Tirana in 1994, marking the first out of many quibbles between Athens and the post-communist establishment in Tirana. Just like everywhere else in the post-communist world, the primary challenges of the early 1990s were unemployment and inflation, and the first government tries various policies to attempt to implement a form of autarky. Most of that fails almost immediately, and for the first time the public discourse starts to sound like in a normal country, with the opposition accusing the new government and especially the new president Salih Berisha of being too authoritarian in 1994. And, unlike just a few years before, the accusations are listened to, given a fair hearing, and then some reform is attempted. This was quite unique in Albania's history. That kind of democratic exercise was starting to be slowly learned. The new regime is, however, more successful in judicial reform and foreign affairs. The connections with Italy are re-established in very friendly terms, and Fato Snano, the communist prime minister from 1991, is sentenced to jail for funds embezzlement in an anti-corruption case that was also a first for the entire region. Also, Ramiz Aliya, the last communist dictator, the successor of Hoxha, is also sentenced to jail nine, nine years for abuse of power and violation of citizens' rights. This trial has been closely monitored by Human Rights Watch and other leftist organizations who usually care about only the rights of mass murderers, and even they had to conclude that the due process rights of the communist dictator and his cronies were largely observed, a conclusion which also added to the credit of the first full non-communist government for judicial reform. Towards the end of 1994, President Berisha, frustrated with the impasse with the communists, calls a national referendum to validate the new constitution, but the voters reject the draft and create the first moment of political crisis in the democratic history of Albania. More of those were to follow. The Albanian Democratic Party ends its full term in office with quite a decent track record, but that didn't matter that much because the socialists had other plans. So while the Democratic Party wins the May 1996 elections again in quite a landslide, the socialists refuse to recognize the results and start preparing for violence. After the appeals court upholds the lengthy 20 years jail sentences for various officials of the communist era, the house of the chief judge of the appeals court is bombarded, wounding two of his minor children as well as two neighbors. The tension in the country was already rising, even while the country's economy was already improving and the general political situation was quite tolerable. And then came the year 1997, about which a whole two-hour episode could be made. Mm -hmm.
short story of 1997 is pretty much like this. Almost every country in Eastern Europe had, at some point in the 1990s, several thriving pyramid or Ponzi schemes. The reason they thrived was a combination of poverty, governmental incompetence and population naivete about how markets work, part of that naivete being owed to the 50 years of communist propaganda which quite literally taught generations of people that in capitalism you can just get rich by doing nothing. Such pyramid schemes happened in post-communist Russia first in 1991 through 94, then in Romania also in the same period and then came Albania, after them came Slovakia in 2000 and 2001. By 1997 most governments had already learned the lessons from the Russian and the Romanian experience, but clearly not enough lessons. However, while the collapse of the Russian Triple M and the collapse of Romanian Caritas both in 1994 created quite a bit of economic troubles, those troubles were nowhere near big enough to collapse their respective countries as a whole. But in Albania, this is exactly what happened. By January 1997, more than one in six Albanians had quote-unquote invested in such schemes. Essentially, every family had invested in some way, uh, shape or form, and one by one, all of those schemes, of course, collapsed. The biggest and the last to collapse was the scheme created by Maksude Kademi, known as Sudia, to the public, a gypsy woman, former shoe factory worker with a penchant for expensive designer wear, as Radio Free Europe described her at the time. The population lost more than $1.2 billion by early 1997, which at the time meant a bit more than a quarter of the country's GDP and more than half of the country's monetary mass, the M1, if you want the specifics. As perhaps expected, the Communists used this to call for violence, and it also didn't help that some of the heads of the Ponzi scheme also encouraged the victims to ask the government for a remedy. Long story short, roughly 2,000 people died between January and late July 1997, and 2,000s more were left wounded after numerous clashes with the police and also criminal gangs. Some scholars describe the first half of 1997 as the Albanian civil war, while others describe it as a rebellion. Some others more have called it the pyramid crisis, but the best description in my view is a rebellion that degenerated into a civil war. These events triggered the first foreign intervention in the country to restore order, with the United Nations adopting the so-called Resolution 1101, Operation Alba. The mission was led by Italy and comprised from the armed forces of France, Turkey, Romania, Greece, Germany, Austria and the United States, and of course Italy. It should be noted that this is one of the few UN interventions in history that actually worked as intended and finished their work and then withdrew as planned. Well, almost, since some of the forces did remain in the country after the official withdrawal order in August, but remained to retrain the Albanian military to modern standards. The effect of all this mess was a round of snap elections and also a referendum on the form of governance. The socialists win the snap elections and the republicans win the referendum, and by republicans here I mean those favoring a republic over a monarchy as a form of government. It should also be noted that 1997 marks the last instance of the 20th century when a member of the parliament is shot inside the parliament uh, by another politician. Democrat Azem Haidari survived the shooting when after being shot at by a communist. <laughs> Just when things were finally getting back to normal, with the now opposition Democrats calmly explaining why the socialist government was inefficient and trying to achieve reform from there, another crisis comes. This time not the fault of the government, but externally imposed. 
The war in Kosovo begins and the Albanian government has to find a way to accommodate the 13,000 Kosovo refugees that had arrived right after the start of the war. In addition to that, the communists, now in power and called the Socialist Party, also try to do what communists usually do, only this time with modern means, to imprison their opposition. They didn't succeed that spectacularly, mainly because the socialists find out that in democracy you actually need to form a coalition to pass whatever you want. Surprisingly to this day, to many analysts, the young Albanian democracy was much more functional than expected, especially when considering the area in which Albania is located and the context of having a war on its borders at the same time. Anyway, in November 1998, the new constitution is finally approved, also by popular referendum, and replaces the patchwork of laws that had been passed since the fall of communism. All of this while the war in Yugoslavia was getting harsher and harsher, and in the next year, Albania is flooded with refugees. About 450,000 refugees arrive in Albania by June 1999. To put this into perspective, Albania's total population was about 3 million at the time. Proportionally speaking, it's like the United States would receive 48 million refugees within a span of two months. And while all of this is happening, the government manages to reform the civil service too, an aspect notable because it was a shrinking of the state at the behest of a left-wing government. You don't get to see that every day, but it happened in Albania. Albania enters the new millennium being included in the Eastern European Stability Pact, which in addition to roughly $450 million in infrastructure investment also comes with an unprecedented normalization of relations with all of its neighbors and perhaps for the first time in history a complete opening of the European markets to Albanian products. This also leads to a significant drop in unemployment and finally crime rates also start to plummet. By 2005, the Albanian authorities were already having discussions specific to a normal country. You know, what to do about human traffic, an issue not completely resolved anywhere in the world, what to do to improve the electoral process, what to do to improve the military, basically things to expect in any normal country. The OSCE mission had already left in 2002 and the political protests started to resemble the ones in any normal country, political violence becoming increasingly unheard of. Obviously, there are a lot more things I could say about this period, but a lot more interesting is how things have changed on the ground and how things moved from the misery of 1991 to the lovely place that can be visited today. So, chapter 2, Economics. <laughs> In many other post-communist countries, Albania's economy found itself with a multitude of challenges in 1991. High rates of emigration, high unemployment, huge inflation and very low incomes, even by the region's standards. However, due to, in part, the incompetence of the governments to regulate the economy, the Albanian people managed to produce results that were quite hard to imagine at the time. With agricultural land privatized in 1992 and with a strong diaspora, the sky was the limit for the entrepreneurs who were willing to endure the harsh business climate in the early days. 
harsh because few people knew what they were doing and business worked primarily on instinct, especially in the 1990s. And that turned out to be quite good, showing once again that free markets don't require a massive government college program, you just need to leave people alone. This translated into certain things that either never happened in other post-communist countries or happened much later. For instance, Albania managed to avoid three-digit inflation, the highest point recorded being in 1997 during the civil war, followed by a steep plummeting of inflation to negative figures in 2000. For the last 15 years, Albania's inflation has remained stable at around 2.5%, making the leke one of the most stable currencies in Europe. There are many reasons for that, one being, of course, the huge Albanian diaspora, whose remittances still account for about 12% of the country's GDP to this day, but also the largely unregulated business environment which allowed for the locals to experiment on the market to levels that would either be impossible or much more expensive in more established and developed countries. For starters, the people solved the food problem. In 1991, Albania was receiving international food aid. The program was no longer needed by mid-1993. Once the state no longer confiscated food, and once the people had at least some form of property, local food production skyrocketed, prices for food plummeted, and today cheap and abundant, almost limitless food is one of the top attractions of this country. To put this in numbers, the net GDP growth of Albania in 1993 was a bit over 11%, most of it driven by private sector agricultural activity. Double-digit growth was achieved again in 1995, with almost 12%. And after the downturn in 97, mentioned earlier in the video, the recovery was also remarkably quick. By 1999, economic growth went back to an average of almost 8% per year and stayed that way for most of the first decade of this century. Now, this doesn't mean everything worked just fine. As mentioned right at the beginning of this video, Albania only got freer markets for most of the time, which means things could have and would have gotten even better and even faster if something similar to the Balcevic plan applied in Poland would have been applied here too. Also, the fact that the state dragged the issue of privatization much longer than anyone else in Eastern Europe, really, and the fact that property rights remained unclear in many areas prevented the Albanian economy to grow even faster. The violent crime wave that swept the country between 1997 and 2003 also had an effect on the economic growth since doing business requires a certain level of security. However, once the state backed away from banking in 2004 by privatizing state banks, something which even some EU countries have yet to do, such as Slovenia, which we'll cover very soon, anyway, once the state backed away for, and the people finally had civilized access to modern credit, things have developed even much faster than ever before. With the lesson learned in 1997, the entrepreneurs knew that there is no such thing as free money, which ended up making Albania one of the countries that did not feel a recession during the 2009 crisis. In 2009, there were two countries and two microstates that had economic growth in Europe. Poland, Albania, Liechtenstein and San Marino. The inherently conservative way the Albanians approach economics had the disadvantage of slower development at first, but in the current year, and looking back at things, it is quite hard to argue that they were wrong. The fact that neither the government nor the population were hugely indebted, like their neighbor Greece was, shielded Albania from much of the troubles brought by the 2008-2009 crisis and the development of the country could continue, although not unabated, since the biggest trading partners of Albania are, and were at the time, in the Eurozone. Nevertheless, it's one thing to experience slower growth during a crisis, like it happened here and in Poland, and a whole different thing to experience a recession, like it happened everywhere else in Europe. If you are to look on international statistics, you will find that Albania's unemployment sits today at around 13%, after peaking at roughly 18% two years ago. To put that into perspective, unemployment in Spain sits at 16% and in Italy at about 12%. But something is different here. 
While in Spain, and really most of the European Union, unemployment is masked through various useless programs billed as education, with huge swaths of youngsters spending way too much time in so-called education instead of working, in Albania the pressures are reversed, in the sense that unemployment appears higher than it actually is because of something that I really like, the informal economy. It is no secret that I am a big fan of the informal economy for the simple reason that the government spends resources much less efficiently than the individual who produces them. In Albania, the informal economy is much larger than in other places, and there are few, if any, reasons to believe it will shrink anytime soon. The government attempted to convince more people to get out of the grey economy by abolishing the flat tax and introducing a progressive taxation system in which those making less than 30,000 leke per month would be exempted from any income tax. The Albanians in the grey economy just laughed and continued to mind their business. 30,000 leke is about $270, which might have been good money 20 years ago, but today that's just a bit higher than the legal minimum wage but still lower than the de facto minimum wage. Hopefully, nobody from the Albanian government is listening to this video because the last thing the country needs is for some other bureaucrat to raise the minimum wage again. Thanks to the industriousness of the Albanian entrepreneurs, the market has set the minimum wage much higher than the government, so it is, in effect, a net loss for those who are now in the grey economy to get out from there and contribute to the lowering of the official unemployment rate. These people usually work for established businesses who, in turn, try their best to maintain a legal turnover of under 8 million leke and thus avoid the 15% corporate tax and also increased from 10% because too many Albanians made the mistake to vote for the socialists. <laughs> This difference between reality and what statistics say is also obvious when discussing wages. According to the government, the average wage in Albania is about 350 euros a month after taxes. In reality, it's about double than that. Even the Albanian Institute for Statistics, INSTAT, admits that there are a lot of cases where individuals have declared a salary of no more than 350 euros, but in reality their income is at least three times higher. The leftists in Albania complain about the high level of income inequality, of course, especially after they found out that some companies pay as much as 1.2 million leke per month, which is more than 11,000 euros. But what nobody will tell you is that even the poorest Albanian today is, in real terms, at the very least 500 times richer than he was in 1990. Basically, everyone is getting richer and the poor are getting richer at a much faster rate than everyone else. And, just like everywhere else, the main threat to this trend continuing is the government. The government's debt-to-the-GDP ratio hovers around 70% and has been on a decreasing trend over the last three years, but it's still very high. Now, there are two ways to solve this, the European Union way, by printing money, stifling innovation, tax everything into oblivion and hope everything works out, and the free market way, which is to lower taxes, to convince more people to observe the tax law and grow your way out of the debt. The latter was preferred in the previous decade and yielded a reduction from 85% of the GDP debt in 1998 to a bit over 50% in 2008. The former is now being attempted and the results don't look promising. The reason the second, less efficient and generally less desirable option is being attempted is due to something mentioned in previous videos about Albania, generalized demoralization, both in the Soviet sense and the classical sense. This is something that I will have to study further, really, because it is quite hard to understand. Things have never been better in Albania and yet the population has never been more demoralized. It also doesn't help when Albanians study abroad and get indoctrinated with Western leftism and then come back to further amplify an inferiority complex that is less and less justified. The country was able to recover from one of the harshest regimes in the world and, proportionally speaking, one of the biggest refugee crises in the world and managed to increase the standard of living of all of its citizens to levels essentially impossible to imagine just 20 years ago, and yet far too many Albanians come off as hopelessly demoralized.
It is really hard to understand why this is the case and the explanation that people in general tend to have much higher expectations simply doesn't hold water. People had and have much higher expectations everywhere in the post-communist world, yet the Georgians, the Hungarians, the Croats or indeed the Bulgarians are nowhere near as demoralized. Now, I won't pretend to know the answer anytime soon, but the situation is worth mentioning because it is the second biggest threat to the continuation of the economic development of the country. One way demoralization can directly affect the country is by scaring away the tourists. While many may not think of Albania as a tourist destination, it actually is. So important that in 2014 the New York Times, a former newspaper, nominated it the number 4 global tourist destination and Lonely Planet included Albania in its highly coveted annual top 10 countries to visit. And that was in 2014. Since then the tourism industry has grown further and further and if you account for its indirect contributions, tourism now means more than one-fifth of Albania's GDP. A bit more than 5 million tourists visited Albania in 2017 at a population of a bit over 3 million. This is quite extraordinary. Now, undoubtedly, affordable prices are a factor, but also the welcoming population is important. I, for one, went here for the communist history, but will go back for the people. But it's not all just tourism and agriculture, it's also energy. The energy shortages of the communist era have been replaced with huge hydroelectrical plants, making Albania the largest producer in the world of hydroelectricity. And then there's also oil. The oil sector has seen a rapid expansion in Albania, increasing the pressure on the government to deregulate and further accelerate the economic growth of the country. This might happen much sooner than many imagine for geopolitical reasons. As Europe is seeking more and more alternatives to minimize energy dependence on Russia, Albania could and would be a solution both for itself and for southern Italy. Speaking of Italy, the largest both import and export partner of Albania is Italy, which explains why Italian and not English is the lingua franca in most of the country. This definitely suited me, since Italian is basically broken Romanian. <laughs> Ultimately, when it comes to economics and wealth in general, it is hard to compare Albania to other places and do it in a fair manner, because it is easy to compare raw numbers without accounting for even recent history. Basically, what I said earlier about people, namely that the rich are getting richer but the poor are getting richer at a much faster rate, applies to a certain extent to countries as well. Albania started in a much lower position when communism fell, but still managed to achieve comparable results even while it had to endure a civil war, a gigantic refugee crisis, an economic crash and political violence all between 1991 and 1998. 
When you consider the whole picture and not just government statistics, the situation in Albania is a testament that free markets are indeed very close to a miracle. Sure, they're far from perfect, but it's much better than would be expected after 50 years of complete and utter oppression followed by 10 years of troubles, many of them inflicted from the outside. So, what to expect in the near future? Well, it kinda rests on how the demoralization issue will be solved and on maintaining a general non-leftist framework. The latter is easier, the former is much harder and indeed I'm not sure it can be solved within a generation. The economy is made out of people and if the people that comprise the Albanian economy don't have the belief, the work ethic and yes, the faith in their strength that things can get better, then things won't get better, at least not fast. The fastest progress will be achieved in the work ethic department. Anyone who has employed an Albanian younger than 35 will tell you they are very serious about their work. Anyone who has employed older Albanians will tell you almost the opposite. This is because communism has a habit of eroding a people's work ethic. The same happened to East Germans, to Ukrainians and really anyone who lived for too long or was brought up under communism. Unlike the Baltic peoples, for instance, Albanians have already shown the tendency to come back to the country after working for several years abroad. Their knowledge and experience gathered abroad will be a huge asset going forward, especially the Albanians who worked in places like the United States, less so the, those who worked in less capitalist places. If I were to be really mean, I would say Albania should try its best to keep away the people with non-STEM degrees from Western European universities. Those would be a significant drain on the country more often than not, as they'd bring with them ideas that would damage both the economy and the culture. The last thing Albania needs is a bunch of westernized leftists who'd come down and tell the fine folks here that they're doing tolerance wrong or try to bring back socialist crap through the back door under the banner of fairness or some other modern era far leftist gobbledygook. Other than that, one should expect continual steady growth in the standard of living and likely an increase in foreign direct investments. Unlike other countries in the region, there are no immediate geopolitical and military threats on Albania, as the relationship with the neighbors have indeed gotten better in the last decades and borders two NATO states. There is, however, one ideological threat to Albania, namely the well-funded Islamist lobby. So far, the country has been able to withstand any attempt from that direction, and that's great, but in order for that to continue, an active push to preserve the status quo will have to happen in the next several years, because nice things require strength to preserve them. So, to sum up, Albania is a place that has come a very long way in a remarkably short period from conditions that are quite unique to Europe and without much help. That makes its progress remarkable in ways that it doesn't for other places that had, at least in theory, some help to rely on. In absolute terms, there's still a lot to do. The lack of passenger railways connections is quite a bummer considering that most railways in Albania do go through lovely scenery that can absolutely be exploited for tourist purposes. Ultimately, it is not my role nor the purpose of this talk to tell Albania what it should or shouldn't do, but I would like to come back here at some point and I'd hate to see the place ruined by mistakes pushed by well-funded ideologues of the far left, so for purely selfish reasons, 
I hope Albania does well. <laughs>